Well, good morning. Good, yeah, there you go. We'll clap. That, that was good. Y'all sounded really, y'all sounded really good singing. I want to welcome you to the lake. If you're new with us, I'm Ronnie. I'm the, I'm the lead pastor, or I'm the pastor buck to pastor. Things roll down to me, so uh, it's great to have you here with us. If it is, you know, just you're here with us for the first time. Uh, you received a connection card when you came in. If you give us some little information about yourself, you know, we'd like to, I'd like to write you myself and just thank you for being here with us. And uh, if you stop by our resource center, we have a gift for you. It's the, and we're getting close to Halloween, so we got gifts for all of our guests who show up and are spending their morning with us for the first time. Uh, we're in this series called Who Can Be Against Us? And we're actually finishing it up today. We've been on this journey through Romans chapter 8. We've just been focused on one chapter for the past three months, and we'll finish it up today. And and what's, uh, this chapter, Romans chapter 8, uh, is listed and considered by many scholars and even us less scholarly people. You know, just enjoy reading the Bible and studying the Bible. We would look at this chapter and join these scholars and say that this is called a chapter of hope. And what's happened in this part of this letter is Paul is writing this letter to Roman believers in Rome the followers of Jesus who live in Rome under Emperor Nero, and they're going through a lot of persecution. And Paul is writing this letter to them to encourage them, to give them an assurance of the hope that they have in Jesus because of their belief that there's hope. And when we read this ourselves, when we look at ourselves, just this portion of the letter over the past several weeks, we've, we've, we've realized it, and, and, and I pray that what you've read and what you heard gives you an assurance of hope. An assurance of hope in the eternity, in the presence of God, that will help you through everything that you're dealing with in your lives today. Everything that you're struggling with in your lives today. Too often we may feel like we're the only ones. That whatever the struggle is in our life, we're all alone. Nobody's ever had to deal with this. Nobody's ever gone through this. I mean, the, the walls start closing in. It seems like life is spiraling more and more downwards into an abyss. And we don't seem to know any way out of this. But when we read Romans 8... Just this one chapter, we find hope, the hope that Paul intended for all of us to use. And it's a really good chapter to read, no matter what you're going through. I mean, if you just need to be uh, encouraged, you, you read this. If you're going through a struggle, you read Romans 8. If you want to be reminded of who God is and what he has done for you, you read Romans 8. If you're going through any kind of temptation, any kind of hurt, any kind of difficulties, it's Romans chapter 8, especially the last part that we're going to look at today. We've been going through verse by verse, and now we've got to the very end of this chapter. Not the end of the letter, but the end of this portion of Paul's letter to the Romans. And we're going to start there today in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And we're going to finish out this chapter. Romans 8, 31 says, What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? Now, I get an email every morning. And in my email, it is sent to me to a Bible verse that I need to read. I can use it just to read it, just to memorize. I can use it to read it, to give me a devotional thought. And I don't know if you have that too, but if this was my verse, if I would have gotten this verse this morning, which I actually... <laughs> reality, just to be honest with you, Franklin Graham posted this passage today on his page. But if, and when I, if this was the only verse I were to get in my email, then I'd say, what's this all about? What's he talking about? These wonderful things. Because this is kind of like saying, therefore, when you're going through the Bible and you read that word, therefore, then you need to go back a couple of chapters and find out why therefore is there to tell you what's happened. And what Paul is talking about when he's talking about these wonderful things, he's referring to everything he has written about in chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8. But that's just going to be too much to cover this morning, four whole chapters. So I thought, I'm just going to focus on the wonderful things that we found in chapter 8. And I listed them for him. Here's the first wonderful thing we found in chapter 8. Is that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. Our sins are forgiven. We've been, ta we've been taken care of by what Jesus has done for us and the way he's given his life for us. And we believe that and we accept that as Jesus sacrificed for us. And now our sins are forgiven. That's a wonderful thing, to have our sins forgiven. The second wonderful thing is that we are God's children. We're, we're his children. He, his spirit comes in, lives inside of us when we follow Jesus Christ. We believe in his death and resurrection. We're a follower of Jesus Christ. God's spirit comes and lives with us, inside of us, and guides us to 
resist our sinful nature that tries to control us. He leads us and guides us to become what He has designed us to be, His children. And not only this wonderful thing of being God's child, we're also heirs. It says that we are, we are His heirs, that we are bro- brothers and sisters of Jesus, sons and daughters of God. We're part of the family of God. We are heirs to God's glory. And the glory is that we get to spend eternity in the presence of God. See, the, I know what you agree. Are these wonderful things to read about? Are these wonderful things that we need to know? Yes or no? These are wonderful things. Yet, it gets better. It gets better. Look what he says next. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? I mean, the wonderful things, that's great. But this is the icing on top. This is the cherry on top of the milkshake, okay? This is, this is the whipped cream on top of the ice cream. And the, this is, I mean, all the wonderful things are great. But this right here, this is really good news, that God is for us, who can ever be against us? And so Paul, at this point now, is going to show us and remind us and demonstrate to us how we can know that God is for us, that God is on our side. And in verse 32, since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. Paul's referring to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that who would ever would believe in him? would not perish, but live forever, have eternal life. And because of God's love for us, he continues to say, won't he also give us everything else? Because God loves us so much, I mean, he gave his son. And if, he, if he's willing to give his son, wouldn't he just give us everything else? Well, what's everything else? The wonderful things. The wonderful things that he's told about, that he would give us no condemnation, that he would make us his child, that he, we would be his heirs. These are the things that he would do for us. And so I was sitting this, this the other day, and I'm thinking, how can I take this idea of these wonderful things that God is going to give us? He's going to give us all of this. How can I make this way for us to understand it? And I came up with this. These are the wonderful things and how God would give these everything to us. He would give us freedom from sin, adoption as his child, inheritance of his glory, truth of his promise, and hope of eternity. Kind of cool, isn't it? That all that is, our, is based on our faith in God for who he is and what he's done for us. We can have all these things. God is going to give us all these wonderful things. So why is it, if we know this and we read this, why is it that most people, and let me say, why is it that even Christians have a hard time believing it, that God would actually do this? Why is it that Christians even doubt God's promises, even when we've experienced His promises in our life, in our everyday struggles? We've experienced God's presence, and yet there's times in our life that we doubt that God, that God would come through, that God would be there for us. Why is it that we still question Why is it we find ourselves still questioning God's plan and purpose for our life? Why is it that we find ourselves second-guessing our role in God's plan? That he could, how could he possibly use me to do anything? Let Let me ask this question. This is a yes or no. It's actually two questions, yes or no. Is the Bible God's word for us? All right, the rest of you. Is the Bible (laughs) God's word for us? All right. Now, is everything included, everything recorded in here, is everything recorded in this book inspired by God? All right. So this is our book. This is for us. And everything in here is inspired by God. So think, think, think this. Is it possible that God, Almighty God, would know that we would have questions in our life about Him. Whether we can serve Him, whether He could use us, whether He really loves us. Is it possible that God knew to today that we would have those questions in our life? And so He inspired the Apostle Paul. While you're writing this letter, I want you to include some questions that I know people have. And I want you to, and so He shares some questions that we all probably have, and He answers them. And I believe God had Paul to do this. This is what I want to look at. I want to look at three questions, three questions that Paul asks on our behalf, and he answers for us. 
The first question is it in, Ro in Romans 8, uh, verse 33. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? I mean, if, if we're children of God, I mean, he's chose us. How dare anyone mess with us? We're God's children. And yet Satan constantly attacks us, constantly gets in our head and causes us to wonder, to doubt God's promise. Did God really do that? Would God really come through? Do you really want really to trust God with this part of your life? Cause us to even wonder if we're really a follower of Jesus and walk around and say, well, I'm, am I really walking the talk? Am I, am I who I say I am? And can people look at me and know I'm a follower of Jesus? Or am I making so many mistakes that they would doubt? See, because Satan reminds me all the time of my mistakes. Not God, but Satan will remind me of every time I've messed up, every time I've failed. Every, he'll point out all of my failures, all of my mistakes, and remind me, you know, how, could God really love you like the Scripture says? Could God really use you to do what he wants done here on earth? Who accuses us? Who could possibly accuse us? And Paul answers, no one. No one can accuse you of anything that you've done. You can't, the past can't come back. You, you can't, you can't be, base your whole life on what you've done. No, no one can accuse you. Get away from that. No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. God took it upon himself to do all he could to make us worthy to stand in his presence. It was done through his son's death and resurrection. He planned that. He allowed all that so we'd be able to stand in front of him with no accusations. Come to think of it, God's the only one who could accuse us of anything. He's God. And you would think he's, you know, he's going to bring down wrath on it. He could punish us for what we've done. But he chooses not to because he's for us, not against us. Paul just told us that earlier. He's for us, not against us. So no one, no one can make any accusations against us. No one can make any, any could press any charges successfully against us because we're a child of God. And no matter how hard Satan may try, God has made us righteous before him. So case dismissed. Throw it out. No, no one can accuse you. Second question. Well, who will condemn us? Because we know we do th things wrong and we deserve to be condemned. And Paul says, it's the same question, just ask in different ways. It's the same answer. No one. No one can condemn you. And let me, let me give you some reasons why no one can condemn you. For Jesus, Christ Jesus died for us. Jesus died on the cross. He took our sins on the cross with him. Our sins are removed. Our guilt is removed. We have been forgiven. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus because he died for you. Not only did he die for you, it says that he was raised to life for us. He was brought back to life to give us life, to give those who trust Jesus for our salvation, to give us life. Jesus even said that in 11, John eleven twenty five 25, that anyone who believes in him would live. Though you were dead, you will live. If you believe in me, you will live. And not only has Jesus died for us and raised back to life, it says that, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand. All power has been given Jesus. All power in heaven and on earth. He is made king of kings and lord of lords. He's not going to condemn you. He died for you. He lives for you so you can have a life, and he's going to do everything for you. He's not going to condemn you. He's actually pleading for us. He's interceding for us. He's representing us. He's, he's, he's speaking on our behalf. Whatever our needs are, whatever we ask for that we need, he meets those needs. So our accusers, our adversaries are no match for him. So again, there, there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So case dismissed. Throw that question out. See, I go through these two questions. I'm like, we should be in a really good place right now when it comes to our relationship with God, knowing that no one can accuse us and no one can condemn us because of God's love for us. God's love never fails. It never walks away from us. It never lets us down. It never rejects us. It never abandons us. But is it possible 
that we could fail God. That we could disappoint God. That, that we could let God down. And if we do, then what happens? Well, that's the third question in Romans 8.35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Can anything? And like we just talked about, it sound, this sounds like this is a no-brainer. Because I just read, I just read in here that nobody can accuse me and nobody can condemn me because of what God has done through Jesus. But have you ever had these thoughts? Have these thoughts ever crossed your mind in your life when things are just not going right? Does it mean He, God, no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? If I'm being tempted, does that mean God doesn't love me anymore? If I'm going through a hardship and a struggle, does that mean God doesn't love me anymore? Does it mean that God doesn't love me anymore if I'm being persecuted, if people are making fun of me and people are attacking me? Does it mean that God doesn't love me anymore if, I, if I'm going hungry, if I'm destitute, having a hard time, if I'm in danger or, or, or threatened with death? Does that mean God doesn't love me? Are there times in my life that God is not going to love me? Have you ever uh, decided to do a project? I know if you see on Facebook, Karen posted a picture of a project that we did over several days. Uh, putting a play set together in 116 steps. It looked a lot simpler in the, in the picture. Oh, we just put that up and that up and a slide on the swings. There's nothing to it. I can do that. 116 steps. And there's still a few more steps to go, but <laughs> they're playing on it, so it's fine. It, <laughs> As long as it doesn't fall down. So, but have you, ever, have you ever taken on a project and then you spend all your time working on that project and you, you're following every direction that there is? You're following every direction and when you get done with it, it's still not right? That something's wrong with it? And you're not happy with it? Now take that thought and let's bring it into our life as a follower of Jesus Christ. We try to serve God. Every chance we can. We try to please God with our life. We try to live our life to become more like His Son, Jesus, every day. We open the instructions, and we follow the instructions. We study the instructions. We're reading the instructions. But life just isn't going the way we expected it to go if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Because I still mess up. I still make mistakes. I still feel like I'm failing in this journey. And at times I begin to feel like I'm all alone. That I've been abandoned. That I really wonder, does God really love me or has he turned his back on me? Does God, does God no longer love me? Because it's not going like I thought. And now let me clarify some things. Do we realize that this is nothing new? That you're not the only one that struggles with this. You are not the only one that's ever dealt with this. Ever. Jesus promised us in John 16, He promised us that this world, in this world, we would have trouble. He promised us that life was going to be hard. And as a follower of Jesus, it would be even harder. They will hate you because of me, is the way Jesus said that. Even said, but, but, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Look to me. I, 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 you, you, you can't be accused and you can't be condemned. I'm over, I've overcome that. And then Paul, he reminds us in his next part, he reminds us in these little parentheses there. It's important because Paul was a Pharisee. Paul knows all the Old Testament. I, mean, I don't know just verses of the Old Testament. He knows all that's contained in the Old Testament. And that's why he says, as the scriptures say. So he's reminding these believers, according to Psalm 44, 22, this is how it reads. For your sake, we are killed every day. For your sake, we are being slaughtered like sheep. So this suffering and the struggles and the persecution have always been a part of life for the godly. It's always been a part of life for who wanted to follow God and listen to God and try to please God and try to do what God wants them to do. It has always been a part of the life of anyone who wants to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, you see, in the Old Testament, they really didn't understand why they were going through the trials. 
they would think that God was punishing them. But when you get to the New Testament, when you read about the saints in the New Testament, whenever they faced a struggle and they faced a, faced a, faced a trial, they traced it all the way back to, to their identification in Christ. They were identifying themselves with Christ when they would go through difficult times. In Acts, the disciples have gone out now, and they're starting to teach about Jesus. They're sharing the gospel. They're actually sharing the gospel in the temple. They're talking about Jesus' death and resurrection in the temple. They're talking about Jesus being the Son of God in the temple, that he was the the coming Messiah that the Jewish nation was still waiting on. No, he came, and you killed him, but he's back to life. And they got brought before the high priest and the religious council, and they were questioned, and then they were beaten, and they were told never to say the name of Jesus again and get out of here. And it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, Then they, the disciples, left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, the name of Jesus. They rejoiced in it. They didn't run and hide, and they didn't feel like, well, God doesn't love us anymore. No, they were being persecuted. They were being whipped and punished because of their faith in Jesus Christ and their being a follower, and it it didn't push them away from God. It actually drew them closer. They used that suffering to get closer to God and rejoice in it. Yes, we are a child. He does love us. We got beaten. Yeah, but I got beaten because of Jesus so that means God does love me. He's why it's, it was a crazy way, but this is how they did it. So again, the question, can anything we're going through in life separate us from God's love? Can anything? Paul answers, verse 37, no. Despite all, despite all these things, despite all you're going through, despite all you've been through, despite all that's going to be coming against you in the days ahead, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. No, you can't be separated from God's love. You might not recognize that passage in that translation, but here's another translation of the same thing, and the same question and the same answer. No. It's the same word. No matter what translation you look at, the answer is no. You, can't, you, you cannot be taken away from God. It, it can't be taken from you. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, who gave his life for us, his life for us. We're more than conquerors. We, he, Paul is saying that we can overcome every difficulty. Whatever the difficulty is, we can overcome it in our life because of Jesus and his death and his resurrection. I like the, the more than conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him. That means that we don't just get by. You know how people have struggles in their life? How you doing? I'm getting by. No, we don't just get by. How, I know you're having a hard time right now with this loss. Right? You're having a hard time with this situation, this circumstance. How are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm making it. No, we're not just making it. We're not just getting by. We're not just surviving this season of difficulty. No, it's not that. We're we're more than conquerors. When we're more than conquerors, that means we experience a victory of victories. The victory of victories over any trial that we face. It's just unbelievable. It's not like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make... No, no, you beat it because of God's love. This is what he's saying. I mean, and, and it's not a wish. Well, I wish I could get through this. No, it's not. A, I wish I could find a way. No, it's not. It, it, this is a fact. Paul wrote it down. It's a fact. And what I like re- about reading the letters from Paul is that Paul dictates when his, when his eyesight is going bad. He even takes it in some of his letters. He's, he's talking, and then Luke is writing it down. And I'm, I'm thinking that Paul gets excited sometimes when he's talking about his relationship with God and how important it is. And here he's talking about, no, that love can't be taken away from you. And I think he started preaching right then, and I think Luke just sat and watched. You ever do that? I mean, Ronnie's talking so fast, he's sharing so much stuff, I can't even write it down. I'll have to come to the second service so I can get the rest of what he said. Or i have to listen to it online Tuesday or Wednesday to find out because I couldn't get it all because he was, he was going. See, I think this is what Paul was talking, and, and Luke is writing this letter down to help him dictate it and all this. And then Paul shifts gears, and Paul starts preaching, because look what he says in 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Nothing. Nothing can separate, ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life. Death. Jesus said, though you were dead... 
If you believe in me, you will live. So death can't separate us from God's love, and life can't separate us from God's love. When he's talking about life, they say, that's odd. No, when the things in life happen, when the struggles come every day, when the temptations come, that can't separate you from God's love. He still loves you. Neither angels or demons. Well, why is he talking about angels or demons there? Well, see, angels, I got a guardian angel. No, they get in the way. Angels and demons do not get in the way. They cannot come between you and God's love for you. It's God's love. There's nothing else. They can't interrupt it. Well, a demon, no, no, they can't. Well, this angel, no, they can't. They're not allowed. It's God's love for you, and it's a straight line, and nothing can come between us. Neither our fears for today, our fears, the daily temptations that we face, the daily struggles that we go through cannot separate us from God's love, nor our worries about tomorrow, the uncertainties, the unknowing. Well, what's going to happen if, no, that I don't know if, 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 if this doesn't happen, would, would, does God still love me if I do? No, it, it's, you cannot be separated from God's love under any circumstance. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. As hard as Satan may try, I said this earlier, as hard as he may try, because he's constantly going to attack us, no matter how hard he tries, he, he is powerless against God's love for you. He can't get through unless you let him, because God's love protects you. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing. He's, he's on this. I can hear him. I can see him pounding on the pulpit and screaming one of those hellfire brims. He's just going, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can do this. He is passionate. He is powerful. He is convinced. And he is point blank straight into it. And the and the. What makes this statement from Paul so powerful and so passionate to me is I've read Paul's life. And many of you have read Paul's life too, and you know the hardships he has gone through. See, he's not sharing, he's not sharing about some theoretical example of God's love or some hypothetical situation of God's love. He's writing from his own experiences. And in Paul's life, he was rejected by his friends. He was chased and tracked down by the government, persecuted, punished. He was beaten, sometimes left for dead. He experienced shipwrecks where no one died. And he's been in prison. He's writing this from prison. All because of his faith in Jesus. All because he knows his He's freed from sin. He's a child of God. He's inherited eternity and he trusts in God's promises and he has a hope for that eternity. His faith. And he's convinced, I am convinced, that not e- that, that nothing, that nothing, not even the worst, the worst thing we could ever imagine doing or the worst thing that could ever happen to us can separate us from the greatest love ever. That's the love of God. This is the eighth chapter of Romans. This is just one chapter. And I hope that over the past several weeks, as we've read this chapter eight, that you take at least just this one thing with you today, that the love of God is greater than any person, circumstance, sin, or failure. The love of God, this great love of God, is above all of that. And nothing can separate us from it. And as we place place our complete trust in God's unfailing love, as as the foundation, that that unfailing love, putting trust in God's love, embracing God's love is, is a foundation of our faith and our hope. It's being developed in us. We don't have it all together yet, but we're, we're growing and we're being developed. We're being shaped and we're being molded by God's love for us. If we just place our trust in that, then hold on to that inheritance of heaven, God's presence. If we do that, then we will experience being more than conquerors through him who loves us and gave his life for us. That means that in everyday terms, in everyday life situations, that we will no longer fear sharing our faith. 
with anybody at any time. Well, I had an opportunity to share my faith and I didn't. I missed out on it. Does that mean God doesn't love me? No. We're, we're more than conquerors through Christ who gave his life for us. So we'll no longer fear from sharing our faith with someone. That we'll be bold in our witness as to who God is and what he's done for us. We'll tell people that we'll be compassionate in the way that we serve others, that we'll be generous. And when we share God's blessings with others, that we'll be united as a body of believers who've come together to complete God's mission for us, His plan and purpose for us as His church. Let me ask, does that sound like an unattainable dream that we could actually live our life that way? I mean, honestly, does does that sound like some kind of silly wish? that I could actually live my life that way, that I could be that bold, that I could be that fearless to share my faith and, and, and discuss and be that compassionate. Is it, is that, or are you sitting there right now and your mind is going through all that I've been sharing with you and you're like, man, I, I, wish, I wish I had a relationship like that with God. I wish I could, I could live what that scripture says right there. I wish I could hold. See, that's, those are accusations and condemnation that, no one can accuse you of and no one can condemn you of. Those are those questions. Say, I don't know if God would love me because of the way I've lived my life or what's going on in my life. I just don't know if God can use me. Paul said, stop it. Nothing can separate you from this great love of God. Well, I wish I had that kind of relationship. You can today. You can have that kind of relationship today. I mean, if you've, been, if you've been living your life convinced up to this moment right now that God couldn't love you because of all the things you've done, that you're convinced right now that God could not possibly use you, you have, you have nothing to offer, then Romans chapter 8, this was written specifically for you. I mean, there's other chapters in the Bible and other letters, but this one right here, Romans chapter 8, was written specifically for you. It is a personal declaration of God's love for you right there in Romans chapter 8. A love that will never fail you, a love that will never let you down, a love that will never turn his back, never abandon you. It was written for you right there. It's a love that's greater than any person, circumstance, sin, or failure. This is what, this is, this is what God has offered us. This is what Paul was trying to remind us. This is the relationship we have with God. Let's pray. God, we know life is a, it's always a struggle. And, and your word even says from Psalm 44, it's always been that way. The Old Testament, the New Testament, thousands of years later, here we are in struggles every day. Here we are in difficulties every day. Here we are where all these struggles and difficulties start to cause doubts. Start to present us with questions in the back of our mind. And and I read it and I've heard it taught that no one can accuse us and no one can condemn us and there's no way that God's love can be taken away from us. Yet I still have questions. How can, how can I make an adjustment in my life to where this is real? It's not, this this is not a dream, it's not a wish, and it's not a, a wonder. This is a fact. How can I live my life with the fact knowing that God loves me this much? That I would be more than a conqueror in all situations. How can I get to me? Allow God, allow God to change you. He changes you in a moment, in a single moment. The moment you realize That he loves you so much he allowed his son to die for you. That he loves you so much that he raised his son back to life to give you a life. To make you more than a conqueror. To not be accused by Satan anymore. To not be condemned by Satan anymore. To not worry about God's love, whether he loves you or not. But to know for a fact that God loves you so much that he will help you become more than a conqueror. There's no one like him. You can read all the self-help books you want. Listen to all the podcasts you want. Download every song, worship song that you want, but there's no one like God and His love for you. 
It's the greatest love you will ever know. And today, you can begin to experience that love if you're still wondering, does he really love you? He does. And not only Paul is saying that, I'm saying that because I've experienced it. And many people in this room have experienced that very same love. So throw the doubts away. Ignore the accusations. Don't even listen to the condemnation because it doesn't apply to you because you've been forgiven by Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. You need to live a life that's bold. You need to live a life that you're more than a conqueror and say that there's nobody like my God and I'm going to live like it, that I'm not compared to anybody else and experience life like anybody else. I have a God who loves me. I have a King of kings and a Lord of lords who died for me, gave His life for me, and lives inside of me. And that's how I will live my life beginning this day in this moment. God, we thank you for the love that you give us. The life we can experience through your presence and the hope that we've been promised from a God who loves us more than anyone else. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.